Oh my God. Can it get any better than this, really? Oh, thank you. Thank you, President Owen. Member of the board, faculty and sta staff, families and friends, and most of all, to the graduates. <laughs> Let me be first to say congratulations to the Northeastern class of 2022. Ah, it is such an honor, such an honor to be with you today. You know, when I arrived this afternoon, I realized this is only the second time I've been to a baseball field. You know, after 30 years. The first time is when I built one. It's a true story. When I started Chobani in this little town, South Edmiston, upstate New York, I realized that children in that town the children in that town were playing in mud. And Cooperstown is not too far from that town. And I've seen that people come from all over the world, all over the country, play in a baseball field. And I thought I wanted to build one as good as the one in Cooperstown. The one that has the scoreboard, lights, a place the families can come and watch their little kids to play. And the first money we made with Giovanni that's exactly what we did. And I threw the first pitch. And to be honest, standing before you now, I wish I had seen this one first. I would have built it just like one this one. This is a this is a magnificent place to celebrate graduation. You know, I was thinking what to say. I look at some of the examples. I see some speakers have a list of 10 things for graduates to remember. And I try to make my list, and I come with two. One of them was eat Chobani. Yeah, eat Giovanni every day, that was one. The second one was, be nice to your mom and, and your dad. <laughs> Especially today, because the baby is graduating from college. But really, that's all I could come up with. And I don't think I don't think we need any list today, especially after the last few years. I think we all know the world has been through awful a lot since your first day at Northeastern. We've had global pandemic, racial strife, difficult elections, Neighbors yelling at neighbors, and this goes on and on and on. And for, the, for those Boston proud, it's even painful to acknowledge on this graduation day that the Yankees are in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Put that on the side. Graduates, as you go through life, there are, there are going to be a lot of things about the world and society that makes you extremely uncomfortable or even angry. There are two things you can do about it. You can avoid it 
you can ignore it or you can work to change it. My hope for all of you today that you work to change it. I have found on my experience the richest life, the most beautiful life is the life dedicated to helping others. You get gifts and rewards that you can't imagine. I still remember the smiles on the kids and the parents when they see that new baseball field. It is magical. The price you have to pay for that magic is making things really better when you feel the world is uncomfortable. You know, first time I have ever spoken in front of anyone was my, in my little town, an eastern part of Turkey, next to Euphrates River, in front of 30 people. I was 20 years old, your age. And I was speaking to 30 people. And I was the first person that going to college from that town. And growing up in that town as nomad son, there were things that I had seen that I did not like that made me extremely uncomfortable. And I wanted to do something about it when I went to college. And I was telling them that I was going to publish a newspaper. And in that newspaper, I was going to write about things that I don't like, like injustice, human rights violations, why we are looked down on. And I was so nervous that I almost lost half of my weight. Some of the people of the 30, they laughed at me. Some of them ignored me. And some of them thought I went mad. I had no idea how to publish a newspaper. I had not even seen a print. But I did it anyway. I published that newspaper for two years, made some trouble, and got me in trouble with the government too. And that's the reason I had to leave the country. When I came to US, and settled in upstate New York in a farm and shopping in the stores, I realized that if you lived in New York and if you are making enough money, you could get food that is good, that is natural, that is wholesome. But if you lived in the rural areas, it was impossible to find good food for your family and for your children. And that made me think that I could make a cup of yogurt that is wholesome, that is available for all. Then, then I come across this plant not too far from where I live. It was a factory that was being closed with a large food company after 70, 80 years. It made me so uncomfortable, so angry as CEO far away, looking at spreadsheets, making a decision to close the factory, abandon the factory workers, and abandon the community that they lived in. I wanted to bring back that factory, bring back those workers back into that factory, start the community back on, start a business and making food that is available for all, and be profitable for future investment. And we did. As we start to grow, as we start to grow, hire everyone that we could, I realized an hour away, there was a community where refugees were settled and they were having a hard time for some reason to find jobs. I said, let's hire them. 
Some of the people said, well, don't hire refugees. If you do, definitely don't talk about it. Shobani will, give, will be get boycotted. You might lose everything you've been working for. I said, if I am going to lose everything, I'm going to speak the truth. That's what we did. We hired few refugees, and then we hired more, and we hired more. And guess what? Today, we are the leading brand, if not number one, yogurt in America. And we have hundreds of hundreds of refugees and immigrants working in our factories in New York, in upstate New York, and Idaho. And, and when I walk around factory floors, when I walk around the factory floors, and that happens very often, the smile I see on their face fills me up inside and enrich my life a thousand times over. Now, I'm trying to convince other businesses to hire refugees too. And the reason for that is when I started hiring refugees, and I, I thought that was a community work. There were people who wanted to work, and we could help them to get on their feet. But when I saw Yazidi girls and women got attacked thousands of miles away, and we see them on news and on newspapers and TV, TV stations. And when we saw them being kidnapped as sex slaves, I got so angry, so uncomfortable. And reached out to UNHCR in Europe and said, what can I do? What can I do? And they said, there are very few businesses that are involved with this most critical humanitarian crisis that we are facing. Maybe you can get businesses to get involved. And that's when I started a tent partnership for refugees to invite other companies to get involved for refugees globally. And message was very, very simple. Don't pity refugees, hire them. We know, we know, the minute refugee has a job, it is the minute they stop being a refugee. During our first year, we had few companies join, but we never gave up. Keep calling them, keep trying to convince them that this was most essential thing to do and it's good for business, it's good for community. Today, Tent Partnership includes more than 220 companies announced to hire and train refugees wherever they are globally. You know, we have still a long, long way to go. President Aoun and other speakers said, what is happening with the war in Ukraine right now? I was there this past April at the Ukrainian and Polish border. I was there to see how business can help. What can we do? And as I was there and walking and, and talking to people, I saw this, maybe in her 70s, an old woman walked through the border to Polish side. She had two bags in her arms, and maybe within 40s, a son that was having a hard time to walk. As she crossed the border, I happened to be there at that moment. I offered my help, and I took the bags that she was carrying. Now I have the bags that she was carrying crossing the border. A volunteer, I remember a, a young man from Germany, he offered a wheelchair for the son. Now we are walking towards the registration center. As we were walking, the bags start to fail very heavy. I start to imagine how she carried these two bags and a crippled son and walked all these times. But I also imagine the weight on her shoulder emotionally, 
how heavy that would be, not knowing where you're going, what to expect. As we walked towards the registration center, there were people lined up in the, under the tents and offering them water, tea, other things to make her feel good. As we walked, she started to feel better. And when we made it end of the line, the registration was already ready, ready. She already knew that there would be a bus was coming and would take her and her son to a city a family would welcome her. She was already better. Just because we knew that she was in good hands, we continue on our work and we say goodbye to old lady. And somehow, 10, 15 minutes later, we came back to the same location and I wanted to see where she was. And I looked and here, there she was in a bus on a second row with her son next to her. And she waved me with her hand and gave me the most beautiful smile that I have ever seen that was close to my mother's smile. With that smile, she basically said, I'm OK now. With that smile, I understood. She said, thank you. Thank you for making me feel safe. Now, I say that story because the smile that I saw in the kid's face in that baseball field, the smile that I saw in that old lady's face is the best gift that being uncomfortable, going after it, and receiving those moments is the best gift that you want, anyone can receive. I promise you. I promise you, there is nothing, there is nothing more rewarding than continuing to show up in the world for other people, no matter how hard it is. Graduates, today, as I look at you in your 20s, I see me in my 20s sitting in there with you, that boy, from the eastern part of Turkey, the nomad sun. I see similarities between us. I can tell all of you have the same fire in you. I spoke with President Aoun a lot about this class and this university. I saw the flags. You have come from over 140 different countries. You have worked in co-ops around the world. You've seen things as global citizen. And all of you have ideas are real and inspiring and attached to no material thing. You have things that bother the hell out of you too. Maybe it's, maybe it's racial injustice gender inequality, maybe it is the unreversible climate change, or the women and children are being forced to cross border because of stupid politicians. And you can't, and you can't bear to see it for another day. My wish, I hope, you don't turn away from the things that make you uncomfortable. My wish is you turn toward them, look them square in the eye, and work for the rest of the, your life to change them. And that is why, and here's why, pardon my language, but people who are comfortable don't do shit. Innovation doesn't happen when you are comfortable. Progress doesn't happen when you are comfortable. Change doesn't happen when you are comfortable. And of course, 
you don't need me to tell you this, but you are the poster children of uncomfortable. Here's the irony. Here's the irony. We have heard that yours is a generation of snowflakes. But here's the truth. Your generation has had more crap thrown your way than just about any other generation in history. And we know you have survived them all. <laughs> Let's look at it. Most of you were born after 9-11. You've had two wars, great recessions, mass shootings, social media bullying, racial injustice, political fightings, even invasion of capital. List goes on and on. And then COVID. And this only made you stronger and more determined to make a difference in the world. Let's be honest. You're not snowflakes. You are survivors. And you have seen the world, and you know it's injustice. You don't believe in hierarchy or compromise or tradition for the sake of tradition. You know what I think? You are the warriors that we have been waiting for. You might not feel it yet, but you have the power. You have the voice. When you stand up to politicians, those so-called leaders, and say they need to get serious about climate change, it does matter. When you stand up to CEOs and say it's not good enough to give lip service any longer to diversity, equi equality, and inclusion, and do something about it, it matters. They'll fear you. I know they do. And if this is 20 years version of you does that, I wonder what will 50 year old version will do. You know, I talk about some dark days thing. It feels winter that is gone too long. And it takes me to my hometown again. As nomads, when we go through a long winter, we can't wait to go back up to the mountain. We can't wait those spring to come. But it is a, a dangerous game to guess when to start going up. If you wait for roses and tulips, colorful birds to start singing and decide to go, that will be too late. You have to be a lot earlier than that. So we look for signs, and if you go a little bit too early, the cold might damage your livestock and sicken your children. And I remember every time the spring about to come, there are these tiny little flowers. We call them snow flowers. When there is still cold, when it's still dark, when there's still snow on the floor and the ground, these tiny flowers, they start popping up through the snow. It is impossible to believe that these tiny bodies can go through these difficulties of snow and winter and show their face up to the sky. They don't wait for the sun to shine. They just do the hard work that is nece necessary because they can't wait the spring to come. Millions of them pushing through the earth, collectively signaling, enough. We never saw them tiny flowers. They were our heroes. They were the first sign that the change was coming. And today I look at 
Fenway Park. And all of you are the sign that that change is coming. I hope, I hope you use the fire within you to change a lot of lives for the better, to bring a lot of smiles. And if you don't know where to start, just remember my favorite poet's lines. And it says, well, if you walk the way, the way will appear just as it, as it did for me, I promise you, it will work for you. Walk the way, and the way will appear. My brothers and sisters, my nephews, my nieces, the future is waiting for you. You have arrived at just the right time when we needed you the most. The magic of Northeastern education is now part of you. The magic of your professors, your academia, your, 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 your loved one is part of you. And I can't wait to see what you do with it. And always remember, always remember, be nice to your mom. Thank you so much. <laughs>